Good morning, I'm Edward Perry. Um, I'm Operations Director at Nosley Hall and the Safari, and I chair the Nosley Place Board. Thank you very much indeed for coming, and, uh, and a big welcome to the first ever Nosley Ambassadors meeting. As you know, I've been working with uh, other private sector colleagues with the support of the local authority on a project looking to raise the profile of Nosley as a great place to live, a great place to visit, a great place to invest in and to do business. And I guess that most of you looking around in this room um, need no convincing what a great place to know it is. But this project is all about getting that message out there louder, stronger, further afield than ever before. It's about standing tall and saying, I live here, I work here, and I do business in Nosley, and it's great. We've got a huge amount to be proud of in Nosley, and we really need to tell more people about it. We also need to make sure that you, as the business community, have the information and the tools you need to help drive this place forward, and that's why we're here today. And there's no better example of actually uh, of, of us driving forward than QVC, and thank you to the team here for uh, allowing us to hold this first meeting. So this is the first of what will become a bi-monthly event on those the ambassadors. Today we'll be hearing from Carl Booth and Stephen Carr about the massive opportunities opening up as a result of developments and projects like the Atlantic Gateway and Superport. But the topics for future sessions will be wide and, and very varied and we'll hope to bring you topical, insightful and really interesting and useful stuff over the course of the year. We've already got a date for our next session and I'll let you have that at the end of uh, the meeting today. I'm also really pleased to say that our final speaker today uh, will be talking to you about the whole concept of the Ambassador Programme and particularly how it's worked in Coventry and Warwickshire, somewhere where they've been working on a similar initiative for a couple of years now. Uh, Les, uh, it is here, Les Ratcliffe, is chair of the place board down there, and I'm sure will have plenty of good things to tell us. In fact, I attended one of their um, meetings um, about two months ago, and was really fired up by the energy of the business community there, but also the, the relevance and interest of the of the topics. In fact, Justin King, former CEO of Sainsbury's, was there, and I hadn't started talking about that. He was pretty, he was so inspirational. He got out at the right time, didn't he? Yeah. <laughs> But for now, just some housekeeping points. There's no fire alarm test plan for today, so if you do hear the alarm, um, it is not a drill. Please can you make your way to the nearest exits. There's one at the back, and of course, the, the route that we took coming in this morning. If you can, or make sure that your mobile phones are switched to silent, that would be fantastic. Uh, remember, we do have a Twitter account, which is at Nosley UK, so feel free to follow us and tweet alongside us using hashtag Nosley Ambassadors. So now that's, uh, that's all out of the way, I'd like to welcome our first guest speaker, uh, Carmel Booth, who's Chief Executive of the Atlantic Gateway. Please welcome Carmel. Good morning, very early start today. Hope you've all had your bacon sandwiches and are energised. Um, I'm delighted to be here today at the first um, session that you're having um, and talking about some of the exciting opportunities that Atlantic Gateway should hopefully bring to Nosley. First of all, what a time to be in the North West. The North West is in the headlines so much at the moment. Every political party of all colours is talking about the North West and it seems as if it's going to be uh, one of the headline grabbers as we go through the next 99 days of the election. I'm sure you can't have, have avoided the talk about rebalancing the economy, the northern powerhouse. There's a real drive at the moment uh, across all parties to get cities, places working together to just try and get that scale. You know, that, that scale which can compete against London and the rest of the world. So all parties at the moment are really talking heavily about how, how all cities, all places can work much, much more together. We've also recently saw last, well this month actually, the government announcement of a six point plan for the North West, um, which was basically a reaffirmation of the commitment to invest quite heavily in transport, science and innovation. I think housing is quick in there as well, but housing absolutely not a topic of debate for Atlantic Gate today to play. 
The North West has seen massive announcements in terms of growth deals for the left and have billions of pounds of investment being pledged. Still a lot to do in terms of proving the case and making those projects happen, but nonetheless, a firm commitment in terms of funding. Autumn statements in December, which brought some fantastic news. Um, again, primarily in terms of transport, and we've got the concept of One North, which hopefully you are aware of, it's a £15 billion potential integrated transport plan for the whole of the North. Now, very, very ambitious, but something which could potentially transform the North West and the North of England if everybody can work together to agree on what the key principles and details of this integrated transport plan could be. So, the important question, why? Why is it that everyone's talking about the North, the North West? Well, I guess as Bill Clinton would, would say, you know, it's the economy stupid, it's the economic potential. And every opportunity George Osborne is talking about what the North West can do in terms of raising the growth levels of the UK P PLC. I'll just put a few quotes down here um, in his Northern Powerhouse speech in the uh, summer. He absolutely firmly believes in the potential of Atlantic Gateway, and I'll, I'll talk a bit more about what that, what that is. But again, it's about how everyone can work better together so that the scale factor again comes into play. The North West, the North, you know, has been un 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 underperforming. It hasn't been um, achieving the same great growth rates as the rest of the country. We're currently hovering around 3%. If the North West can pick its growth rates up, so it's at around 4.6% um, growth, growth rate. The government believe that actually the price of the North West is an extra £18 million in terms of economic value to the economy. It believes that could be potentially 100,000 new jobs by the end of the next parliament. And this is a net net win really in terms of the North West benefiting, but also in terms, in terms of sustainable growth for the North West long term, but also in terms of the I think what's really encouraging though, as I've, as I've mentioned already, is just this cross-party support. Without that, <coughs> it'd be very difficult to have any long-term plan for growth. We need the momentum, we need this cross-party this cross party support, so beyond this May, whatever happens, we have all parties absolutely firmly committed to improving the North, developing plans for the North, investing in the North. So, Atlantic Gateway, what is it all about? Private sector led board. It spans three LEP areas. It basically covers a geography between Liverpool and Manchester and the corridor that's in between that. So we've got Cheshire Warrington LEP, Liverpool City Region LEP, and Greater Manchester LEP. What's really important is we have membership from government and in particular from the Treasury. We all know that when it comes to spending, you need to get that commitment from the Treasury to actually make things happen. So the board includes representation from Treasury and from Infrastructure UK. And the board members comprise a variety of private sector partners who work very closely with the LEP. So I'll just put a few down here in terms of some of our board members. It's not all of them, but it just shows you really an example of some of the really big corporates that we have involved. Some of which have a long-term interest in terms of the North West. Well, actually, all of them have long-term interest in terms of the economic success of the North West. But I think more important than that is about the sustainable angle, how we get sustainable growth for the North, the North West. Let's not use our assets to waste them now. How do we get the long-term benefits for future generations? So the opportunity itself, you, you can see here we've got this fuzzy boundary, as I like to call it. We have this growth corridor. People tend to be very fixated on boundaries. Atlantic Gateway likes to believe that actually it's the opportunity which dictates what that boundary is. So yes, across three left, but actually we're talking about a port and Stephen will say the sphere of influence is hours, you know, it's hours of, of uh, journey time away from the um, uh, from the end port. When it comes to science and innovation, it shrinks slightly there as well. So the actual boundary that we look at for three left areas working together on those really big ticket projects and initiatives, when you get to scale, you need to work together to really promote and get that, that own growth. And I've highlighted two key transformational priorities which Atlantic Gateway focuses on. 
connectivity freight logistics, which we, we think are very integrated, and we'll talk about them together, but also science and innovation. I've talked about sustainability. Very, very important to Atlantic Gateway. We've got some fantastic assets in the Northwest, but we can't just use them now. We can't just use the port and the ship, the ship canal. Those are some of those fantastic assets that we have. We need to protect those. So very much focused on long term. How do we get the development, but ensure that it is fit for purpose, it's used for the future? And skills. To make any of this happen to get the growth, there needs to be a long term plan in terms of skills. Now, Atlantic Gateway can't do everything. It's not a mini RDA. But what it does do is work with many key players across the region to ensure that the skills agenda is really at the heart of this growth. As Stephen will say, to get the port development up and running to reach its full potential, we need to be looking 20 years from now. What does the apprenticeship scheme look like? What are the training opportunities? We don't just wait for that for 20 years, we can get that now. And as Edward's mentioned, we have some absolutely, truly amazing world class asset opportunities already in the Northwest, in Atlantic Gateway. I've mentioned one North, which is you know, such an opportunity to truly transform how the Northwest transports its passengers and its freight. I think for the first time, you know, freight's really at the forefront of that. Traditional models of transport are focused on people. No surprise that Atlantic Gateway is absolutely focused on people, but also freight. How do we ensure that we're making efficient use of those networks so that we're, you know, we've got the right capacity at the right time, we've got efficient supplies and supply chains? We've got those networks in place now, but they are creeping, and that's why One North is absolutely essential. I think government would say that actually Northern Powerhouse is all about One North. If we get One North right, that will deliver the Northern Powerhouse. What Atlantic Gateway would argue is that actually Atlantic Gateway, uh, uh, one, one North, an investment in, tran in the tran transport, it's the enabler. It's all about it is, it's the enabler. And from that, we need to get the growth. We need to spot the opportunities and get the growth in the jobs. We've got two fantastic images here, just to show that actually we've got some great things that are already taking place in our big Atlantic Gateway initiatives. We've got the Mersey Gateway Bridge, 600 million pound project, currently in construction. Voted one of the top 100 infrastructure projects in the world, gained some stiff competition, so that's a massive opportunity there. We also have L2, which I won't steal Stephen Stunder, he'll talk all about <coughs> L2 and what that means. We're again £300 million investment in a dredging and redevelopment of the port of Liverpool, you know, one of the biggest opportunities in terms of port centric logistics, supply chains that the country's seen, and it's happened right here and now. We've also got some great science. I haven't got an image here for you on there, but if you go down the road to Darlesbury, we have some fantastic initiatives that are taking place by big players in the sector and smaller players. So big business, small business is working very, very closely together. Now, did you know that we have the world's largest supercomputer at Darlesbury? Now, there's no other place in, in the world that has a computer with the speed and strength that we have in Darlesbury. And that's being used right now in terms of improving supply chains, working with manufacturers to improve how they do business. Jaguar Land Rover and Bentley are very actively involved with Darlesbury. One of those major car manufacturers is actually using Darlesbury um, and their virtual um, suite. They can make a prototype virtually. They can test it virtually. They're saving time and money in terms of having to make those prototypes. You know, just think of the supply chain impacts of that. You can get to market so much quicker. So that's why science and innovation is really important in terms of the broader supply chain. They're not separate, they come together, and when they do, they're very, very highly powerful indeed. So, freight logistics is so, so important to Atlantic Gateway. We have the concept of a super port which I hope most of you have heard about here. It's about a collection of the region's you know, best assets and expertise when it comes to logistics, supply, supply chains. But I guess most of you may, have, may think that Superport port is not the port. No, that's wrong. <laughs> the port is at the heart of it, but actually it's not the port. That's just the point at which goods come in and out of the country. Yeah, you've got lots of immediate uh, warehouse facilities, 
pleasure on creation to the ground now. But actually, what L2 will do is to transform the supply chains and businesses of the Northwest and beyond. It's not about Liverpool. It certainly isn't about Liverpool. This is about a UK-wide opportunity. When you look at journey time between fields coming into the south and coming into the north, the sphere influence is huge. To make Superport work, it needs to engage with the whole of the Northwest and beyond. The benefits are enormous, absolutely enormous. Now, I've, I've given a few examples of supply chain benefits in terms of working with seismic and innovation. You can think about the time savings that will that be achieved for Superport for your businesses. We're talking about having you know, the slickest supply chains to save you time, to save you money. And this opportunity is happening right here and now. How to open the end of the year. And, and again, we'll hear more about it then now. And to make this work, I put down here just four critical su su success factors. But there are a few more, but I think that there are four real key, key ones. First of all, we need to be able to access the port. We need to get goods in and out the port. So we cannot ignore those transport issues. Government have pledged funding for this. You know, we, we were very lucky in the North West and got the funding in place to um, secure this investment. So much more work needs to be done to underpin that and make sure that it, that it actually happens. So to get the, the full potential of the port, we need this investment. We also need the key sites and planning. You know, it's industrial park and Amiga, you know, two big opportunities which will benefit enormously from port development. We need goods and manufacturers to be located in and around the port area. And I'm not talking the port itself, I'm talking the narrow parts of the near port. We also need the private sector to be actively engaged in this. And that's the private sector across many, many levels. We're talking about shipping lines, we're talking about manufacturers, we're talking about retailers. We need businesses to be familiar with the opportunity, what this can do for them, and to be actively engaged in the benefits of support. <coughs> and we have people with the need and the ability to go. So, is this of relevance to Nosley? Well, I really hope that after hearing some of the things today, you believe that it is. It's absolutely of relevance to you. So, who wouldn't want to be? in an area which will benefit from those supply chain benefits that Stephen will talk much more about now. And Nosley has so much to offer in terms of the development of Atlantic Gateway. Some fantastic sites, fantastic track record in terms of working with the private sector, the excellent networks, very little congestion compared to other areas. It's got so much to offer. It's right at the heart of Atlantic Gateway. It's in between Manchester. You know, and that position, that place is really valuable. That is that what is what makes Mosley very, very special. It's right at the heart of the Atlantic Gate Gateway. So businesses will be even more competitive. You've got access to even more markets. But my word of caution would be Mosley can't afford to stand still here. Lots of places not just in the UK, but around the world, are investing smartly and heavily. So to remain competitive, to remain attractive to businesses, that investment absolutely needs to continue. And we think ahead about what the next opportunities are, what can we do to ensure that people are coming here and not going elsewhere. But the, the Northwest at the moment, I think, is on the cusp of a, a real infrastructure investment bonanza. And we need to ensure that not only the North West gets its fair share, but we need to make sure that Nosley gets its fair share, which ultimately will benefit you all as businesses. So that's a, that's a snapshot, a very quick introduction to Atlantic Gateway. I'd like to introduce Stephen Carr now, who will wax lyrical and give you so much more information on the transformational benefits opportunity that is out there. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Good, good morning, everybody. Um, what I want to do is just spend 10 minutes or so just to talk a bit about the Liverpool 2 project, but how um, the North of business community can use it as, to its advantage when it goes out and sells itself uh, nationally uh, and, and beyond. So I'll start with a few slides just to explain 
what Liverpool 2 is and then move on to its, its benefits and how uh, I think you can take advantage of that. Um, you'll notice this is one of our favourite pictures of the port because it's one of the few images that we have uh, that allows you to see the whole port complex in Liverpool. So for those of you unfamiliar with the docks, um, this image here runs for, the, the, the site runs for about four miles towards the city centre. Um, in, in the foreground is the existing container terminal, uh, which um, uh, which sits right out on the, uh, the, 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 the mouth of the River Mersey. Uh, and we run four miles towards the, the, the city centre. And already, um, this container terminal is adding value to lots of supply chains within uh, within the northwest. Uh, you know, so within some of those uh, containers, there's, there's product for Kellogg's, uh, there's, uh, the, there's um, uh, the Thai food, uh, the tea out of the UK, so the how Thai food used to court. Um, even depending on the time of the year, there's probably about 200 containers full of artificial Christmas trees that are waiting to go into supply chain. And all of these are driven by adding value to supply chains. And I guess the message we try and get across is, yeah, a port somewhere where ships go, but actually it, it's a bit of a, it's a hassle. Stopping at a port is a hassle. What we try and do is add value to those supply chains. And what's great about Atlantic Gateway is looking at that full journey and how the infrastructure is in place to support that. And Liverpool too is just one component. The problem with Liverpool today um, is, is um, Glasson and Lock, which you can just see on this image here. So, so Liverpool's traditional trading partner was uh, North America. And all of the East Coast ports in North America were constrained by the Panama Canal. And therefore, Liverpool didn't need to be able to take vessels any bigger than those that could fit through the Panama Canal. Um, in, in reality, uh, we all know that the world changed, and that's meant Liverpool's been isolated from uh, many global supply chain routes on, on a direct basis for, for a number of years. Uh, so our solution is to build a, a new container terminal in the river, uh, which is uh, Liverpool 2. Um, uh, and that then removes the physical barrier for, for big ships to be able, big container ships to be able to come uh, in, in, into the port. Um, and, and this is what Liverpool 2 will, will, will look like. Um, there's a funny story about these, these pictures. When we were about to launch Liverpool 2, we realised we changed the operating model, but we hadn't changed any of our imagery. Uh, we got these pictures created very, very quickly, and I was paranoid there was a blatant and obvious error on them. Uh, and there was one journalist in the audience whose hand shot up as soon as we finished the briefing and I thought, oh, here we go, what's the error? And his question was, will your crane's reel be ready? Um, <laughs> and uh, it was about 10 seconds after we'd answered that question, we found out that most of the journalists in Merseyside are Evertonians. Uh, well, um, what, what you see here, um, this picture can't really give you the uh, size and scale, but, but those, those cranes uh, that are over the ship will be around, around about 300 feet high. Uh, so those of you are familiar with the docks in Liverpool, that's as high as the tallest building within, uh, within the dock system. Uh, we'll eventually have, have eight of those. Uh, and then the smaller red cranes over the container stacks, um, they're going to be remotely driven and, and, and sem semi-automated. It'll be the most, um, some of the technology we'll use, it'll be the most modern terminal in Europe. But the value in these cranes being remotely driven is it makes the jobs more accessible. So you don't have to go out and find up, um, climb up some ladders in snow, wind, hail, uh, and whatever else the elements are thrown at you. It's actually a bit like playing a, a, a computer game in a, a, an office desk. Uh, and if you've seen my performances on computer games, you know why I've been told I can't have one uh, on, on those. Uh, so that's Liverpool 2, and as you can see from that image, the, the vessels will be uh, in the river, um, outside of the lock system, thereby uh, removing the, the, the barriers and constraints. And then you can just get another image here at, at, at ground level to see uh, start to get a flavour of, of, of the size and scale. Um, but what will happen here is, is uh, the, the trucks will actually drive in uh, and go uh, right underneath those cranes uh, and, and the movement of the container from the stack to the lorry will be automated uh, with the exception of the last metre. So not only will the cranes be driven remotely, the crane driver will be driving three, four, five cranes at a time depending on the um, I know there's lots of discussions about, you know, do you use uh, imperial measurements, do you use metric measurements? Um, uh, of course, in, um, in any big construction project, the official unit of measure is the London bus. Um, uh, as, as you can see by this image here, we'll, we'll have over uh, 1,100 London buses. Uh, it's the size of the key wall uh, that, that we're building. That's, that's three high and 375 uh, <coughs> long. Um, also on the surface, we could fit um, uh, four football stadiums. Uh, on that. Um, 
I was hoping that would be Bolton, Bury, Wigan and Tramier, yeah, but unfortunately the powers that be have gone for um, the two big Manchester clubs and the two big Merseyside clubs. Um, quite hardly would it, the ball hit three on, I don't know which one of those we would have left out by the way, but that would be my decision. Well that just hopefully gives you an idea of the size and scale of the physical construction project that's, that's, that's coming out to the ground. And, and when you think that we, we're trying to build this in a, in a river that's, uh, that's very tidal and has a very strong current, um, it's, it's, not your, it's not your typical construction project. Um, but as, as Carmel said, we should have uh, the first, first vessel should be alongside and berthed by the end of this calendar year. Um, that will be a finger berth and the containers will be shunted round to the existing container terminal. The land footprint should be operational by probably um, March 2016 or something of that sort. So vessels will be worth in there from, from the end of this calendar year. But well, it's pointless building Liverpool too if you if it doesn't connect to anywhere and, and, and we've used this map now to talk about our plans and aspirations for about five years. And what we see is, is we're not just building a, a Liverpool too, we're adding to the infrastructure of the North West. Um, and it enables the North West to be a real hub for supply chain and logistics activity. What this picture shows you here is it shows you um, a really strong motorway network. And uh, the good thing about starting too early is this morning the journey was nice and easy. Um, it, it shows you that we also have a very, very strong rail network, you know, both, both you know, and certainly you can see the West Coast Main Line in there. Uh, and, and this area is blessed with a number of rail train terminals that offer um, a really good service and really good value as well. And then the red line that, that runs through there is, is the, the Manchester Ship Canal. Um, and uh, we've got plans to develop a number of logistics sites, multimodal logistics sites along the banks of the canal. So, so containers can go up to the warehouse door by water all the way to, to the heart of Manchester. And as this year progresses, I'm, I'm quite confident we'll start to bring some, some positive news on, on, on bringing some of those schemes out of the ground uh, over the course of the next few months. Um, people sometimes ask about the branding of Liverpool 2 and why did you come up with Liverpool 2? Well, when we build the first terminal on the ship canal, that means we're going to have Liverpool 2 and Manchester 1, um, which is, again, appeals to a number of people in our, our business. But the reason we're doing it is this, so um, um, those of you involved in, in, in supply chain will be able to convert some of these um, uh, into in financial savings um, on, a, on a more detailed basis. But um, at, at the moment, the, the main container ports in, in the UK are Felix so, and, and, and Southampton. Um, and you can just see some of the distances there. I'll just pick two, you know, traffic park and leave just two, just two random destinations. And you can see the difference that Liverpool offers in terms of mileage. And this is the point that Carl Ellis was talking before. <coughs> Um, about the time saving that gets us off, uh, get, gets to the mileage saving translates into uh, fuel savings and, and time savings and, and improved reliability. And, and, and this is what's driving the value. And so when you think about using Liverpool 2 as a proposition to sell Dorsley as a, as a place to invest in, these are the sorts of values that Liverpool 2 brings. So don't be afraid of, of, of using Liverpool 2 and, and the investment around that around the broader area as a reason to sell and invest in, in, in those. I'll touch on a couple of those points in, in a moment. Well, this translates through to a saving of around about £20 per tonne uh, of, of product in a, in a container. Um, for exporters based in the region, it transforms their competitiveness because they don't have to get product to sell to both ports. Um, and, and ultimately, it's, it, it underpins this region's ability to be a supply chain hub for the, for the country. It adds to the existing infrastructure that exists with, within the rail freight terminals, and it provides multiple routes into into warehouse infrastructure in the northwest. So I mentioned Taiku. We've worked with Taiku for a number of years now. Um, they have a, uh, a production plant, a bagging plant in on, on the Wirral, and they had traditionally shipped through Felix so and, and brought product up by um, by, by road. Uh, and they typically take four containers a day into the site. And you can see here the profile, the time profile that they have. All four containers arrive at the, uh, the delivery point at the same point in time. Uh, it means that the truck drivers have poor congestion in Felix store. Uh, they hit road congestion on the way up, so that the timing is unreliable. So when those containers arrive at, at the plant, uh, it means that the plant's congested because four trucks are arriving at the same time. It means staff have to be taken off production duties onto goods in duties. And also, you can't really say with any certainty when that's going to happen. What they do now through Liverpool, because of the proximity, is they only deploy one truck rather than four, and that vehicle can do uh, four journeys over the course of a, a drive.
climate has changed. And you can see here that that means that some of those problems, or many of those problems, get, get, get removed from, from, from the supply chain. Um, uh, and I didn't drink all of those cups of tea when I went into to climate this year. So that hopefully just gives you one very brief example, and, and, I, and I could spend hours talking about lots of different supply chains we, we, we've worked with so far. That just shows you this could apply to business investing and also as well as uh, around the world of Northwest. And so just to try and sum up and try and bring some of that uh, as, as, as relevant to, uh, to, to the Norsley area, um, I've touched on the fact that it means that businesses in the Northwest will have a port that means they can import and export directly. They don't have to go on uh, long land transport journeys or, or use speeds by a little pool. Um, as well as offering great savings on transit time and, and financially, it also delivers a big uh, CO2 benefit as well as, as shipping by water. It's a much greener form of transport than, than shipping by, by road. Um, and then these last two points are the ones I want to try and leave you with as a, as a business community in Norsley and how you can use these as, as, as benefits to sell the, the, the Norsley area. Um, Norsley is one of its natural assets is its location how physically change where, where, where places are. And actually, if you remember back to that map, if you look at the fact that you're both close to the port but close to the motorway network, I'd always mean the M57 and M62, I mean in the north-south M6 as well. It's a fantastic place to locate a, a warehouse in our supply chain business. But you've also got the added benefit of being close to the port and also close to the major rail freight interchanges with which I mentioned before. And what does that mean as the opportunity for, for the um, it, it means that Nozzle is really well placed to attract inward investment in, in supply chain and, and logistics activities. For individuals, it presents huge job opportunities, employment opportunities. And I don't just mean you go in and you get a job for a couple of years. Actually, supply chain and logistics can't be people careers for life. I, I work with people who started work 20 years ago on, on the warehouse floor driving forklift trucks, and they've progressed through training routes to become either a HGV driver or team leaders, shift managers, warehouse managers, and, and then into general management. So supply chain can be a, a, a career for, 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 for life, and, and Carmel touched on some of the work around the skills and, and, and opportunities. Um, it's also a big industry. I never realized this until relatively recently, but 8% of the UK workforce is, is employed in supply chain or logistics related activities. So it's not a we shouldn't see it as a, as, a, as a dirty industry, actually. It's one that can be embraced. It's one that's growing. It's one that's going through quite huge transformation with the shift towards uh, um, internet retail, TV retail, I should say, before I get in trouble for being here. Um, and, and the different channels of, of, of selling product, it, it's transforming the way many supply chains uh, work. Um, and, and, you know, Nozzle can be at the forefront uh, of that. And then finally, for many of the businesses who don't see themselves necessarily as working in the supply chain or logistics sector. Actually, what that investment, inward investment will bring is secondary opportunities for the supply and, and provision of services. So, um, Liverpool 2 is coming. Um, we're too far down the track to change our mind now. And, uh, and if we did, which we're not, I would want to be the one to tell our shareholders that. Um, so it's coming, we'll be uh, up for business for the end of the year. Uh, and, it, and I think, and I hope I've got the message across, it's a huge opportunity for, for Nosley. And um, it's, um, it's something that um, hopefully we can continue to work together. And um, what's good for Liverpool too is hopefully good for, for, for Nosley and vice versa. So thanks for your time. And I think we're now heading up into questions. Thank you very much indeed. Indeed, um, thank you, Caroline, as well. What strikes me is that um, as a business leader, the last seven, eight years, you've been nosed down. It's all about, being su about, about, about survival. Um, the local authority, understandably, have been talking about cuts in many ways. But I think what both our speakers have done today is to actually lift our heads up from that, the grindstone, and, and look up and beyond. It's not just about parochial noses, it's not just about our own issues on our doorstep. But it's about the opportunities of the future. And I personally, I've heard about the Atlantic Gateway in Singapore, but I've, I've brushed it aside thinking, it's nothing to do with me. It's, not, it's, it's the strategy of those political masters. But actually, what struck me today, no, it's all about us. It's about our, our schools as well. It's about really trying to get those skills forward now so that actually our 
residents can find those jobs. It's about the hotels. It's about understanding what our opportunities are. Uh, we're just going through a master planning phase of the safari park, and that just all this just gives me this huge encouragement, this this confidence that's so important in this world. So I think what today has done to me is just just really remind me that the future is bright. And one of Stephen's uh, quotes there was that actually there are so many opportunities here. But I think that's what the Place Board is all about. It's trying to talk positive. It's actually saying how lucky we are. By accident of geography, we have the most of the normal opportunities. My other observation is that uh, Stephen and Carmel didn't have to be here. They want to be here. And from talking to them earlier on, uh, talking to Stephen, logistics is, is all about the weakest link. If there's a weak link in it, then the whole chain fails, actually. And we are one of those links here. And the stronger we are, then actually the better it is for all of us. So I think it's been a very striking and, and very brilliant um, first session for the Ambassadors Programme. So thank you very much indeed. Uh, we are going to give you the opportunity to, uh, to ask some questions. Um, and actually, what about, I'm going to start it off, actually. I'm going to start, actually, with a question to Dale. Because we had a place called meeting the other day, and Nosley Industrial Park was, was really the theme of that. Um, Dale, from your perspective, what opportunities do we as a place have um, offered by, by Superport and the Atlantic Gateway? Do you want to come up and uh, maybe? <laughs> um, <laughs> we've heard there from Carmel and Steve really the opportunities and, and how well we're placed as a borough. People will have to drive past us either to or from the port in that sense, and so we, we need to give them that reason to, to stop. I think that the other thing for us, where we are today on the industrial park, it is the largest employment area in the city region. It's only second in the northwest behind Trafford Park. So in terms of where you would base logistics businesses, manufacturing businesses, it's in Nosley. Um, what we've got to do is make sure that we're fit for purpose. And we've done a, a lot of work in the, over the last few years to ensure that we're ready to take those opportunities when they come. Whether that's by luck or judgment, I'll let, uh, I'll let you guess. But uh, you know, a main one, we talk very much around transport, growth, deal, etc. We've been extremely successful as a borough in attracting funding in to improve our infrastructure network. Um, we've had funding approved, just signed off last week as it happens, around improvements to the industrial park to ensure that people literally don't just drive past us, that you know, we make it so easy to get onto the park and off the park that it supports logistic operations. QVC are here with their regional distribution centre. Again, that's not by chance. We've just recently seen Matalan join the family and come in with their distribution facility. It's because of the location that we've got that makes it special. It's a key attribute in the, the sort of nosy story, and there's copies here if you haven't seen them already, around the themes for the borough, around it being Liverpool's heartland for making and moving. So yes, we've got the freight logistics, we've got some fantastic names from the, the manufacturing side of things. The other parts of the Atlantic Gateway around the science and the innovation, you automatically will default to thinking Salisbury or the universities. The reality is our manufacturing businesses will not exist and cannot exist without science and innovation. That is intrinsic to their future success. Um, I'm fortunate enough that I sit on the, the making it board for the city region, which is a, a partnership of, uh, of the leading manufacturers across the city region, setting out what their ambition is moving forward and what we need to do. So very much the, the science and innovation links are key to us. Like you say, one of the big challenges moving forward is the, is the skills and gender, making sure we've got a, a workforce that's appropriately skilled to take advantage of those opportunities. The businesses themselves are seeing problems on the horizon. Sadly, we're all getting older and, and their workforce is getting older, and therefore making sure that they've got the young talent coming through. I think one of the challenges we've got, and it's good to see a, a couple of our own schools here today, is, is to actually get that ambition into the, into the young people of the city region, make them aware of what those career opportunities are, because sadly when you talk to them about manufacturing or you know, you can drive or Jaguar or Land Rover, yeah, it's a production line, you, you stand there and press the button and that, that's it. Well, sorry, it's far more than that. Likewise, freight logistics, oh, it's, a, it's putting a, driving a forklift truck, putting a pallet up, putting it on a truck. 
It's not, it's, it is all about how you move goods around the country, how you make goods, how you design them. And I think that's passing your people by. That's something we need to, to get into there. And I think the only way we can do that is by working with the people in this room. It's no good a local authority going in or a school teacher standing up and saying, these are the career opportunities. The, the young people need to see it and hear it from those people that are doing it for themselves. So I would just urge you all to, to obviously work closer with us um, to achieve that. But certainly I think for us the opportunities are, are immense and uh, we've just got to make the most of it. And you will see those of you that come onto the industrial park that on a regular basis, you will see over the coming months some major improvements to both the, the access off the East Lanks Road, but also the, the access and connectivity around the park as, uh, as we bring forward those, uh, those improvements. Yeah, thank you very much indeed. Um, can I throw any questions up? Uh, okay, moving on. Um, it's time to welcome Les, Les Ratcliffe, um, who's Head of Community Relations at Jaguar Landra and Chair of the Coventry and Warwickshire Place Board. He's my opposite, opposite number um, down there and is leading the work to elevate the profile of his area. And as I said earlier on, uh, when I went down there a couple of months ago, there was a real sense of optimism, that buzz, that networking. It was networking with a, with a difference. It wasn't one of those sort of speed dating networking where you get thrust a business card into your, into your hand. This was genuine relationship networking, and it was very powerful indeed, I thought. Les and the, the place board down there a couple of years ahead of us in, uh, in those weeks. Um, so I've asked him just to tell us a little bit more about his work, the, the program he runs, and, and to really understand the, the opportunity and the potential of our ambassador's program here. Because from what I saw from the Coventry of Warwickshire Champions, they've got something really quite interesting going on. Let's go. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me up here today. And first of all, what a great story you've got to tell. I didn't know about that. <laughs> um, it's one of these things you drive around or through and just refer to. Uh, but I think you've got a, a, a really good story to tell, which brings me on to why, why I'm here today. Um, I, I suppose really, why, why, why am I chair of the Coventry and Warwickshire place? Um, certainly down in Coventry and Warwickshire, which has traditionally been the home for Jaguar and a nearby Land Rover for over 70 years. Uh, our, our company is, is very much part of the community. So, um, and certainly within my role, it's an opportunity to, to continue that leadership and have, have our presence in, in, in the community, and, and in this case, the business community. Because like your area, we've got a great story to tell. Uh, so when we first started looking at that, uh, this nearly three years ago, it was an opportunity to galvanize business in the area. And typically we were coming out of the recession so, uh, and it was about the future and what we were going to be doing in that area in particular, but also a chance for other businesses to start talking up the area as well. Um, and, and that's really how I, I got involved in that. Um, so it, it's really good to be here today uh, talking to you about our experiences. We were going to show a video, but uh, there's a gremlin apparently, so uh, we're going to get some slides instead. Um, the launch of the Coventry and Warwickshire story uh, was a move that business leaders, as I've mentioned, and many organisations across Coventry and Warwickshire has been waiting for, really. Um, the story emerged from concerns that Coventry and Warwickshire's voice wasn't getting heard above those of other places. That we didn't have a simple story outlining our successes. Great companies, global brands, and what we're good at, at as, as in terms of a place, and that we need, needed a shared sense of ambition. At the centre of this activity, we set out to create a knowledgeable and engaged group of champions, that you call yours ambassadors, we refer to as champions, who would play, part, uh, uh, play their part in selling and developing the place, just like all of you. This is why the programme came into being, and it is uh, overseen and the resultant financial contributions managed by a place board, which I chair. Um, as a board, we had a very, a very clear objectives uh, uh, in establishing the champions. One, we wanted to give people, especially businesses, to ch a chance to hear and see what fantastic assets we have in Coventry and Warwickshire. 
we're also learning about developments, initiatives and innovations from those that are making things happen. And just a word on that, Coventry and Warwickshire. Um, we as a business, Jaguar Land Rover, spread across the borders from Coventry to Warwickshire, north and south. So it made sense to us that we talked as a whole rather than a city or rather than a county, uh, which the, some of the politicians obviously find difficult to do. But we said that's how we operate and that's the model which we've taken, hence the Coventry and Warwickshire champions. At the second point, we wanted to provide a high quality place oriented environment for the private and public sector to come together to share ideas and create new opportunities. That's what we've been doing uh, over coffee and bacon, like the, the models carrying on, uh, and a sandwich for the last three years. And of course, the, uh, the early morning starts. Uh, Sarah, who's our place board manager, who runs all of this, when she asked me to come up today, I said, yeah, I don't mind doing that. She said, it's a half past seven start. I thought, oh dear. She said, well, you started it all over. You, you suggested half seven. It does work though, doesn't it? Uh, the third point, we wanted, to, uh, wanted people to get a buzz uh, and shared sense of confidence that they could pass on to others um, you know, the good news, what's going well in, 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 on our patch. And we wanted to make sure that at a time of public uh, sector austerity, that businesses and others were doing everything they could to be place leaders and create materials and opportunities to spread the message. So nearly three, three years on, we think we are delivering on those objectives and most encouragingly, the businesses tell us how much they value the meetings, the connections and actual business they provide and the knowledge, knowledge they deliver. Uh, the Champions meetings are a to-go uh, uh, business event in the region. And we're averaging about 130, 140-ish people turn up at these meetings. Over the last three years, we've heard from people who are making a difference across our area about products, ideas and brands that are driving our economy from successful individuals with an affection for and an attachment to Coventry and Warwickshire. And we've heard from the likes of the CEO of 7th Trent, Eon, the Rico Arena, uh, Silverstone, uh, Motor Industry Research Association, obviously people from my own organisation, the Dean Coventry uh, Cathedral, Vice Chancellors from the universities, and of course the last one uh, was just in King, uh, the uh, ex-CEO of uh, Sainsbury's. So really good speakers talking of the areas and interestingly we're, we're, we're finding people who don't live and work in the area but were born in the area who made good to actually bring them back in to talk about their, uh, what they think of the area where they started. It's all part of that story. We have visited some of the area's most amazing uh, venues, uh, Warwick Castle last week, uh, nice dark half past seven morning, uh, that was interesting. Uh, a stunning area to, to have a meeting. The Royal Shakespeare Theatre, the Rico Arena, which I've already mentioned. For those who don't know, it's now the home of the Wasps. So we've got a Premier Rugby Club on, on our doorstep, as well as a struggling football club, but they'll, they'll come on. Uh, new buildings uh, at both universities. We, we're blessed with two uh, world-renowned universities in Coventry, uh, Coventry Warwickshire, and also a new creative Quarter uh, in Coventry, which is called the Fargo uh, uh, Village. The last three years have seen, uh, seen us establish the programme and deliver activity that wouldn't have been possible without uh, financial support of champions. And this is always a gritty area to uh, uh, get around a discussion. But you can't function without some kind of financial support. Uh, this, resu this resource has resulted in a Coventry and Warwickshire showreel, taking on a greater proactive role at uh, MIPPEN, an investment uh, uh, event uh, in, in Cannes, uh, also the UK MIPPEN, which we attended this year as well. Uh, MIPPEN is the biggest property event in the world. The establishment of a PR programme focused on national and international media, uh, producing joined up marketing materials for investors, business and leisure tourism, to name but a few. 
all this material that's available to, to our champions. In the coming year, we want to literally take Coventry and Warwickshire to London and to Birmingham. Uh, why not? Because we see ourselves not isolated in where we are. It is important we are a key part of the community in that area. Birmingham is on our doorstep. Links from Coventry, you can be on a train in 55 minutes to Coventry. Uh, motor, uh, motorway structures are a bit, uh, a bit harder, but it, it, it's that close. And uh, we're looking to take that message to London. That's a key event in London with a key speaker to get our message out to important target audiences. We'll have our strongest and largest presence ever at MIPIM, which I've just mentioned, as we ensure that Coventry and Warwickshire attracts the investment it needs to grow and thrive. We will continue to focus on peace and reconciliation, which is Coventry is well known for, at a national and international level. Uh, we really want Coventry to be seen as the world place of recon uh, reconciliation, peace and reconciliation, which we think it is, but we've got to get that story out further. We have retained PR support for the forthcoming year with the sole aim of getting our success stories into national and international media and much, much more. In September, we moved the Champions events to meetings that are only available to those financially contributing. So for the first year or so, it was open doors. Um, this was, of course, to maximise revenue to de deliver activity and, and can't be funded in any other way. We don't get any grants. Like I've described in our plan, to maintain the quality of the events and venues visited and to give some recognition to those who have con contributed, whether that's in kind or in cash, whatever the amount. This has been well received by the champions and potential champions alike, and the number at our events continue to grow. Just over 100 organisations have already signed up to the champion scheme in Coventry and Warwickshire contributed between £500 and £5,000 because they believe so passionately that the place should be proud of what it has to offer. And that's based on the size of the company. So finally, a great deal has been achieved in the last three years and it is heartening to hear the many stories of how the new approach to promoting and developing the place has benefited so many organisations in Coventry and Warwickshire. Specifically, it is great to listen to the examples of companies and individuals that have come together through the champions and have developed activity together that has not only benefited themselves, but the place as well. It is this approach of self-help, doing things differently, and sharing place leadership that will see the area go from strength to strength. So thank you once again for letting me outline the Coventry and Warwickshire's journey and our story. Thank you very much, Steve. That's, that's <laughs> key message I took away from that is that uh, we're not the first to do this. And I've witnessed the success of, of the, the champions you have down there. And if anybody has any suggestions as to subjects and speakers, they should be informative and inspirational. And I think that's what the Ambassadors Programme is all about. It's about telling the stories. It's about rewriting the past and really drawing out the assets and, and, and talking about the present with a real optimism about the future. So thank you. That, that, that was terrific. Well, I think we reduced close at uh, 9.30, so we're pretty much on track there. Um, I think this meeting has been a great start to the programme. It's taught us to look up out and beyond with confidence and optimism. And I hope to see even more of you at forthcoming meetings. The date for the next meeting is actually the 18th of March. Um, same time, nice and early, um, but the traffic is good. And the venue and the topic are still yet to be confirmed. But please put the date into your diaries, and we will be in touch with you very shortly. And please spread the message as well. As Les said, it is our aim to be financially self-sufficient and if we can actually get the quality of speakers and the right subjects, then we'd like to, to, to make it a central part of any business, business leaders toolkit.